Good evening. Welcome back to Mental Health in Your Neighborhood. This is Louise Cassioni. I am here on a very hot September night. It's 93 degrees in Boston. I thought I'd share that with you. Um, I do have a guest this evening, and she is online. Uh, she is with the Prison Pol Policy Initiative. Her name is Leah, and I'm going to ask her to say hello. Hi, Louise. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I'm glad that we were able to make that connection because we just put it all, pulled it all together today. That was very good. I was interested in hearing uh, something about um, Prison Policy Initiative um, and Peter Wagner because I've been reading quite a lot of uh, material that he has presented and shared among uh, defense attorneys and uh, prison reformers like uh, Massachusetts Cure, of which I am the state chapter ch uh, chair. And he said that you had just written a very exciting article and that he thought that I should interview you and you should talk about it. Well, I'm very glad to be here. Um, the report that Peter was referring to um, is actually a new report that we released earlier this year about this really um, disturbing new trend in local jails. We found recently that a growing number of sheriffs are actually deciding that letters from home are against the rules. So they're banning letters from family and friends coming into the jails. Wow. Uh, that's hard to believe. We were pretty surprised, too, when we first heard about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, what, what's the basis uh, for any sheriff in any county in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts 
saying that letters from home are a breach of security or something? Well, actually, fortunately, um, we don't know of any sheriffs in Massachusetts that have jumped on the bandwagon with this. Mm -hmm. but, um, more than a dozen, dozen other states um, do have um, local jails that have, that have jumped on this bandwagon. And sheriffs are basically um, claiming that this might be a way to perhaps um, streamline the mail screening process because nobody has to actually open an envelope in order to screen the mail. But, of course, what it actually does is just deter people from writing to each other and decrease the volume of mail um, at a really huge social and um, are, are you social. Okay. Leah, are you able to say which uh, states are currently uh, using this as a... Um, uh, uh, some kind of a regulation in the jails? Well, unfortunately, it's kind of a, uh, maybe perhaps fortunately, it's a, it's a local issue. So it's really county by county. Um, but, you know, we've, we've come across counties from, you know, California to Florida to Oklahoma that have really jumped on this trend. So, um, so, the, so the sheriff who is the, like, the superintendent of a jail... Uh, or above the superintendent of a jail is making the determination that letters from home are somehow not to be shared with inmates that they're intended for. But how can they stop U.S. mail? Well, what happens is when the when the letters come to the jail, um, you know, a jail that has imposed this policy will often just send them right back to the sender and say, you know, you're not allowed to send letters. Instead, if you want to send in mail, you have to send everything that you want to say on a postcard. Oh, so that it can be easily read by whoever handles the postcard. Right. Although, of course, you know, there's lots of things you can't do on a postcard, like mm -hmm. get artwork from a child or, you know, get a report card or mm -hmm. uh, have mm -hmm. personal arrangements to, um, you know, secure post-release employment. So postcards are, you know, a pretty dramatic shift from being able to send really important information in but, I, but I also have to ask as to whether or not the U.S. Postal Service cannot be um, contacted to find out if that is somehow a violation of federal law. Well, um, you know, the post office, I'm sure, is, is um, responsible for delivering the mail to the jail and then, you know, returning it when it gets returned to sender. And actually... Um, people have brought lawsuits against the sheriff saying, you know, this is absolutely outrageous. And um, earlier this year, actually, a federal judge found that a postcard-only restriction in Oregon was unconstitutional because the claims that the jails were making, um, you know, about why they needed to impose such a dramatic restriction just didn't hold up in court. So, so it sounds like, Leah, <coughs> that what you're saying, even though we're... We're not aware, and please correct me if I've misunderstood you, even though we're not aware of any counties in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts restricting mail from families to inmates in prisons, and no, in jails, rather, not prisons, in jails. Um, it's, it's a good uh, heads up for everyone listening who has a loved one who is incarcerated uh, in a jail waiting trial or whatever, um, to let them know that if this kind of a ruling comes down, that they should do something about it. And what, what would you suggest they do? Well, um, we've been really encouraged by um, the success, success of some of the grassroots organizing campaigns we've seen around the country against postcard-only mail restrictions. For example, in um, Santa Clara County in California, the sheriff proposed a postcard-only policy, and the local advocates mobilized. They pulled together a really impressive public forum where people were able to come and tell the sheriff directly how important it is to them to be able to communicate via letter to their loved ones that were in the local jail. And the sheriff actually backed down and reconsidered um, and really paid attention to the concerns that people in his community were raising. So. Um, that's a really, really exciting example of, you know, how much, how important it is to really stay on top of these policies and, um, you know, tell, tell the sheriff why 
communities need to be able to correspond. Exactly. <clears throat> but the, uh, the other thing that this sounds like to me um, is the uh, attempt uh, that was made here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to have uh, drug-sniffing dogs at the um, um, visiting centers in the prisons, um, presumably so that if any girlfriend, wife, mother, grandmother, baby in a diaper uh, might be carrying some kind of contraband into um, an inmate that it would be stopped at the visitor center. And what happened was we complained about it here on this broadcast. Uh, we, I called the governor's office. I called the Department of Correction uh, superintendent, uh, the uh, commissioner, uh, called everybody. And what I, what I got as a response was that no one was outraged that some people thought it was a good idea. But I also heard from a couple of legislators that they had not even been informed that this was on the planning tablet, if you will, for um, some kind of uh, substance abuse control, which is ludicrous because the one joint or the couple of pills that could be carried in by a visitor who is scrutinized and patted down and, and has to go through uh, an electronic um, wand um, test, um, that, that this wouldn't anywhere near um, uh, change the focus of all of the drugs that we know are currently in prison uh, when prisoners can get drugs, elite street drugs, of better quality than some of our um, uh, street folks, uh, it's ludicrous to imagine that, that putting dogs in the visitor's room uh, would be a deterrent. But the other thing, that I, the reason I say that is because that is similar to what you're saying about the no letters and only postcards because that puts a barrier between the inmate and his family. And if anything, um, most of the inmates that I have heard from who write to me and he, whom I have known for 30 some odd years uh, have said how important it is for their families to support them and to write to them and tell them what's going on in their lives or in the, in the lives of family members that they don't get a chance to see. And it would seem to me that the, dog sn the drug sniffing dogs and the no letters, postcards only, has a kind of uh, punitive, similar kind of um, uh, presentation that would uh, keep families, uh, uh, you know, away from supporting inmates that they want to support, uh, so that they'll be available when they get out of prison. Absolutely, you know, that's absolutely, you know, a really important um, thing to note as a, as a broader policy question is just, you know, what what is the cost of erecting, as you say, so many barriers between incarcerated people and their families? And, you know, you and I know sort of on a, just a common sense level how important you know, people's families are to them in terms of being successful when they get out and, you know, maintaining really critical ties to children, keeping kids connected to their parents. But then also, when you look at the social science research, I mean, it's, it's unanimous that, you know, one of the best things that um, prisons and jails can do for people when they're inside to help them succeed when they get out is to allow them to preserve those ties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when you, when you add on, you know, the, the professional... Um, Correctional associations, such as the American Correctional Association or the American Jails Association or the American Bar Association, I mean, across the board, everyone is clear that um, about the importance of family contact in terms of exactly keeping, keeping families together. And exactly, together. I, I know. I, I just, I just think that it's such an abomination, and I hope that <clears throat> just talking about it on this broadcast, because as you may or may not know. Our broadcast reaches uh, down to the Caribbean, back over to Europe and back and, and across the country. So uh, people who are listening uh, from California uh, or Florida uh, might be given a fair warning uh, about this potential restriction, and they might want to start calling their elected officials, if nothing else. Is there anything else they could do besides calling their elected officials or, or being aware of this possibility? Um, 
Well, I think certainly, um, you know, being as educated as possible on the subject. So as you can say, you know, they're in a good position to um, really speak out should this issue arise. Um, or they can, um, if they're interested, they could read the report that we issued by going to www.prisonpolicy.org. And actually, we just released a new video to accompany that, um, which could be used for, you know, community organizing or public education efforts. Um, I think we can. I think we can share that too. We can. We can pass that on. That would be great. Yeah, we have a an, uh, very um, uh, qualified engineer tonight who is. Uh, going to be putting this broadcast um, on um, Facebook <coughs> and um, what else Minister Hobbs <coughs> I'm sorry it also goes on YouTube as well as Facebook um, those are our major pla media platforms okay because Leah had asked me by way of email today if she could share it with social absolutely ne absolutely networks, yeah. Facebook um, YouTube and will also be on Ustream as well okay Okay, so, so you got that, Leah. Great, thank you. Yeah, so thank let's you. let's repeat that um, that address. Sure, it's www.bostonpraiseradio.tv. That's our main web page. But if you go to Ustream and type in Boston Praise Radio, you'll also be able to put the broadcast. So if you go to YouTube and you type in mental health in your neighborhood in mm -hmm. today's date, then you'll also be able to pull up this um, live recorded broadcast that will be archived there. How about that? Okay. So, so that uh, answers Leah's question about uh, sharing it with her s social platforms. Yes. And, and we've, we've become so social. Uh, I was here, I was reading something about um, some inmates who were going to have access to a social network, and I wasn't sure where I was reading it uh, from, uh, but it's something to look into because one of the problems with um, the, the members of Massachusetts Cure uh, of which um, I'm the chair and the mail comes to this church at 670 Washington Street in Dorchester, 02124, um, is um, related to, um, is um, uh, we're active in encouraging uh, families to stay connected by way of this broadcast, even though we know that inmates do, n do not have an opportunity to hear the broadcast. So what happens, Leah, is I write a little summary about what I've been doing on the broadcast in the newsletter that does get mailed into the institutions to the uh, inmates, uh, prisoners who are members of the, of the organization. So that's how we do that. That's how we communicate with them. Great. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit more about prison policy while I have you on the line. Sure thing. So we are... Um a nonpartisan nonprofit um, based out in Western Massachusetts. And what really drives the work that we do is exposing the impact of mass incarceration in its broader sense. Mm -hmm. So really how mass incarceration impacts um, pretty much everybody in this country in some way or another. And um, our longest project has been about how um, the Census Bureau counts prison populations and how the rise of mass incarceration started to actually distort the way our, electric, our electoral districts are drawn um, on the local and on the state level. So that's been our longest project, but then more recently we've picked up this issue of the communication policies in prisons and jails, which is where the postcards come in, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. postcard restrictions, and we've also been doing a lot of work on the outrageous cost of calling home from prisons and jails, which has gotten a lot of um, a lot of media attention recently. And and <clears throat> I remember 20 years ago raising the issue of exorbitant fees that were being charged to families to allow the inmate, um, the family member, to call home collect. And that was 20 years ago, and it's still happening. And I understand that millions of dollars have been uh, overcharged and raised by different um, entities within the criminal justice system for them to use any way they see fit, which may or may not benefit the inmates at all. 
Exactly. As you say, it's a, it's a deeply broken market that's been deeply broken for a really long time. Right. So, so that's another thing to, for people to have a heads up about. Um, exactly. If, yeah, if you, if you have a loved one in prison and they want to stay connected and call home or they want to speak to a child by calling home, collect, it's very important to take note of how much it's costing you and to report that again, report that up the chain to the elected officials because they're the only people that can change the laws, change the legislation um, that is allowing uh, these kinds of exorbitant fees to take place. And if it were happening with a group of students or a group of um, um, other uh, people um, anywhere, uh, there would be a, a hue and a cry in opposition of it, but there seems not to be too much energy behind um, uh, pointing it out when it's an inmate's family that's that's having to pay exorbitant fees. I do have actually a little bit of, um, of hopeful news to share on the um, on this issue on the fight for prison telephone justice. Great. Um, after about a decade, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good to have good news every once in a while. Yes, yes, I'm, I, I'm, um, all, I'm all ears. <laughs> after more than a, a decade, actually, the Federal Communications Commission, which um, has jurisdiction over, um, definitely over interstate calls, which are the most expensive, has finally voted just a few weeks ago to um, set an upper cap on the rates that prison telephone companies can charge uh -huh. to the families of incarcerated people to call home. So unfortunately, we're still waiting on the exact text of that regulation to be published so that we can see all of the details. Mm -hmm. But um, they did they did take some concrete action. So that was definitely um, you know, a step in the right direction. And in addition to that, Charlie Sullivan, who is the founder and president of National Cure, which is now an international organization, um, was asked to appear before the FCC in Washington, D.C. last month. So um, uh, I know that what he did was to uh, tell us all that he was had been invited to speak at the FCC and asked each of the chapters, and there were 46 state chapters and six issue chapters, asked each of us to um, weigh in, to give him some comment that he could uh, encapsulate and bring forth to that FCC commission. So, so maybe uh, a combined effort statewide and um, uh, interstate might make a difference this time. Absolutely. Charlie gave a great, um, a great presentation. I was able to actually watch the, oh, great. the live streaming on the website, which is actually, I think, up on YouTube now. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, and the, the other thing I want to say while we're talking about Charlie is that he's going to be here live in the studio on uh, September 25th of this month, um, and I'm going to interview him for the first time on mental health in your neighborhood. And the reason that the, uh, for that title, Leah, is that I, I spent uh, over 40 years uh, as a, um, a um, career employee in the Department of Mental Health, and I know quite a lot about mental illness and quite a lot about what happens to mentally ill people uh, as a result of um, stigma and um, shame attached to having a mental illness versus having something like a broken leg or diabetes. And um, we also started talking um, about uh, mental health in your neighborhood in terms of the positive uh, um, types of services that are available in the community that are accessible to any numbers of people who are in the community. But when your neighborhood happens to be a cell, it's quite limiting uh, in terms of uh, whether or not you take advantage of a mental health program that uh, does not honor HIPAA uh, confidentiality and uh, anything that's said by an inmate is, t is passed on uh, to be placed in their record to be reviewed any time a person is uh, under consideration for release. So that was uh, the reason that we said, well, maybe maybe the your neighborhood is a cell, and that's where we should be directing our efforts. And that's really interesting that actually you should mention that, because 
um, returning to this this issue of the, the letter bans, we actually found that mental health issues was actually a major concern of some of the sheriffs that are saying that there's no way that they would implement a letter ban. For example, in the um, Los Angeles County Jail, which, um, as you likely know, is the, the largest jail system in the country, so they probably get you know more mail than anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, a spokesperson from that jail system said that he wouldn't consider even banning letters because precisely he was really worried that that would exacerbate mental challenges. Right. It would really mm -hmm. sever mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. mental emotional connections. So, of course, and if, and if someone does not have a mental illness when they're incarcerated, uh, the circumstances of their incarceration and such things as solitary confinement and abuses that could happen on either side of the fence um, can uh, create a, uh, a disturbing effect on one's emotional well-being. So if you, if you weren't mentally ill when you went in, you might, along the way, um, need some kind of support because of the circumstances that you're living under. Absolutely. At the very least, at the very least. So, um, and uh, and I've been reading the statistics. I've interviewed Lois Ahrens from The Real Cost of Prisons a couple of times on this broadcast, and she has talked about the uh, the numbers of people um, who are mentally ill in prison, uh, and that number exceeds the number of those on the outside. So it's it's really important. And and I I know. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention uh, for those people listening who say to themselves or to each other, um, I don't have anyone in my family who's in prison, so this issue is not important to me. Um, I would call their attention to the fact that their tax dollars are creating the largest growth ind industry in the United States of America through new prison beds. Um, so I, I, we, we've been talking about that as well. <laughs> Absolutely, and actually, even on, I would maybe add that even on a broader level, um, I think a lot of folks don't quite realize how people in prisons and jails, you know, are usually there maybe in jails for a matter of weeks to months or in prisons, you know, a couple years. Most people aren't in for, you know, really, really long sentences, and mm -hmm. when they get out, they really need to maintain these connections that allow them to get a job and reconnect with their families and, you know, pick up pick up the pieces where their life left off when they became incarcerated. So it's really in everyone's best interest. Mm -hmm. And particularly if, uh, if there is a disparity in uh, those people who are uh, end up in jail versus those people who can do something else uh, to pay for their um, mistakes in the community. And I, I speak of the... Um, um, the information that we gathered from the book written by Michelle Alexander, uh, The New Jim Crow. And uh, one of my colleagues in, uh, I th in one of the Carolinas, I'm not sure whether it's north or south at this moment, it escapes me, but she told me that 90% of those incarcerated in prison were black. And uh, there certainly a, is not representative uh, of the population in the, either of the Carolinas. Uh, in this state, for example, we have uh, perhaps um, 18, 15 or 18 percent um, uh, minority population. I hate that term minority, but that's a, it's a number. That's all it is. Um, but the, uh, there is a disproportionate number of blacks in prison. Uh, up to 35 percent, so that so there's disparity even in a liberal state like Massachusetts. I used to think I was living in a liberal liberal state until I started hearing all of these uh, statistics about what's happening in the prisons, and I've decided that we're not much different than other states. Sadly, pretty much across the board, as you mentioned, you know the racial disparities in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's really important because the the um, the subtitle of that book, The New Jim Crow, is called Mass Incarceration. And as a matter of fact, there's a, um, a conference um, that's being held at Boston University School of Law, um, which I hope to attend in October, the 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And thank you very much.
Minister Hobbs, Johnny on the spot here. Uh, Boston University Law School Auditorium, October 3rd through the 5th in 2013. It's called Mass Incarceration and the War on Drugs. And I, as a drug counselor with inmates uh, 30 some odd years ago, um, I, I believed that we had lost the war on drugs then, so I don't know why we, we think we're still at war. We've lost the war. But anyway, there's a very interesting conference, and there's some fabulous speakers, not the least of which is uh, Dick Gregory. And um, he's, he's kind of in my generation, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but it's uh, um, the conference host is Reverend George Walters Slayton uh, from here in Boston. So uh, I wanted to give them a plug because I do want to attend that conference. I will be there as well, actually. Oh, then we can meet face-to-face. -face. How yeah, nice. very much looking forward to it. Yeah, I really enjoyed um, the conference last year, and I learned a lot, and I'm very much looking forward to right, right. back, and would love to um, meet you and if any, um, you know, listeners. Uh-huh. Well, well, yeah, that, that would be great uh, because, as I said, uh, Charlie Sullivan is coming from uh, Washington, D.C. on the last week of September. He's going to miss that conference, and he's also going to miss another conference that's at uh, Northeastern on the, the 26th in the evening that, that I'll talk about in my next week's broadcast. But uh, there's some really exciting things uh, happening because this disparity of the numbers of people of color who are incarcerated for longer periods of time, thereby making them ineligible ever to be voters, is is very uh, dicey, and it really needs to be looked at. It needs to be examined very carefully by all of us. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, Peter Wagner, will, uh, <coughs> who is the head of your organization, would either be able to come and be on the broadcast live or would uh, let me interview him on the radio. This way, the way you are. <laughs> Although it would be nice if we had your picture because I, I see your photograph in your resume and you're quite an attractive young lady. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it would be nice. Uh, th th that's a good thing about uh, the, uh, the video is that uh, people can actually wow. sue who's talking see who's here yeah yes like minister hobbs <laughs> <laughs> yes 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 we uh he's he's my engineer and he's also um keeping all of the uh the various social networks uh alive while the, while the live broadcast is going on yes indeed and doing my best and uh because of of the work that you do um i have become a sort of pen pal with a regular listener who lives in australia oh wow and she has been after the broadcast she had been calling me on the telephone and now that she has my email address and i have hers yes she actually sends me uh her feedback about something we've talked about on this broadcast i love that that's our beloved sister i mean she asked if you were going to be on tonight so i know that she's tuned in listening to us now yes so ibina Ibina. Welcome. I know she's listening. Yes. So, uh, and that, that lady is from Australia. Yes. Leah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. And she takes great interest in this because she's interested in the, uh, in the racial injustice and the disparity yes, yes. as well as the, uh, the uh, information about drugs. And, and uh, we've talked about the, uh, the marijuana yes. changes yes. And, and what controversy that has raised, particularly since if the, if the laws about marijuana are changed and fewer people get incarcerated, what does that say for all those people who were incarcerated for enormous numbers of years for the same so-called crime, using drugs? Right. When they should be in drug treatment instead of uh, incarcerated. incarcerated. Yeah, I've, I've always felt that. Um, drug treatment is, is better than being incarcerated because it, it changes your whole, it changes everything about who you are and what you have done and what you have become and um, also makes it more difficult. And you mentioned this earlier about um, getting back um, to, uh, to a re-entry uh, of your 
your former life uh, once you've been incarcerated is even more difficult uh, because if you want to be reconciled with your family, uh, you have to b have maintained contact with them. If you want to be reconciled with the community, you have to be able to show them that uh, you're ready to uh, take up and uh, either go back to school or get a job or, or do something that's, that supports the, uh, the social concepts that we all aspire to. Right. So yeah. when we have, so for example, you know, local sheriffs talking about, well, they really need to save money mm -hmm. by focusing, getting distracted by mail policy, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps one point that community members um, might want to raise is, well, maybe we should focus on, you know, really investing in reentry programs so that we can sure, be assured that people aren't going to come back and that they're going to really have the tools that they need mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and the support that they need on the outside. And there's also there's also a uh, an ex prisoner group in Worcester that has been talking about jobs, not jails. Um, they've uh, had some uh, quite a lot of activity to draw attention to their uh, interest in seeing uh, the millions of dollars that are presumably being set aside to build new prisons or rehab existing prisons. Uh, to create new, perhaps 10,000 new beds in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. God, that's frightening. We already have 44,000 people incarcerated, so why would we want to build 10,000 more beds? I don't understand it. I don't. I really don't. Um, but anyway, uh, this other group uh, out of Worcester has been um, doing quite a lot of work uh, r related to the changes in the Cory Law and also uh, changes in the plan for building new prisons versus using the money for reentry programs and jobs for people coming out of pr prison. And we do know that 80% who are incarcerated will be released. They've got to be released to something positive. Right. No, to me, absolutely right. To me, it seems like a really fundamental question of um, misguided priorities, you know, really focusing on throwing money at the problem rather than, you know, really investing in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I also uh, did a, a short piece a couple of months ago about a, um, a um, purchase of service organization that uh, provides uh, prison beds throughout the uh, states, and they will not sign a contract with any state unless the state guarantees 92% occupancy of those beds. So that tells me that if if you if they provide the prison beds and they want gar a guarantee that they'll be filled 92% of the time, that they're not going to be doing anything of a rehabilitative or reentry vocational training or anything um, methodology while someone's incarcerated. They just want to keep the bed full. Right. That's that's scary. So, so those folks who are just listening to what we're saying and hearing for the first time that as taxpayers, this is what you are buying, might want to take notice of what we're talking about this evening. Absolutely. No, whenever, whenever budget discussions come up, you know, it's really important to um, check out the line item for the criminal justice system and really see... Um, you know where your tax dollars are going. I know, but I, I think my I think my uh, my uh, my inclination is to believe that fewer people look at at uh, criminal justice and prison beds as an issue uh, of interest to them. They might look at uh, how much money is spent on um, uh, on the budget in some of the state departments. And they might be interested in education, but they really don't pay much attention to prison beds. And one of one of my mantras is that if if we can afford to spend almost fifty thousand dollars a year to incarcerate an adult male, and all we are willing to spend is seven thousand dollars a year to educate a child, what are we doing? Yeah. It's a pretty, pretty stark disparity that um, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't speak very well for 
for the next generation. Right, and there's there's a, another organization that uh, has been uh, the, the women have actually been on this broadcast, uh, Mothers for uh, Social Justice and Equality, um, and they um, they represent mothers whose children have been murdered on the streets, um, whose interest is not only in providing support to other mothers who lose children in this horrible way, and children could be in their 20s, of course, um, but also um, they're concerned about the young people who might lose their lives behind prison walls. Uh, so that's, it's a two-pronged um, approach that these mothers are using, and they have been on this broadcast a couple of times, and I will have them back again because they are at their, they are looking at such things as, as you just mentioned, looking at the budget. Uh, they've been looking at the educational budget, for example, to see uh, what the school department is willing to invest in children um, when they're young before they're adults or adolescents in trouble and then go that's, to prison. Mm -hmm. And that's such an important discussion to be having, not only um, because of the devastating impact on individual lives, but then the systemic impact on entire communities, particularly, as you mentioned earlier, the communities that experience disproportionate incarceration rates. Yes. So when you're mm -hmm. up a really significant proportion of an entire generation, mm -hmm. But that has some really serious implications for um, the well-being of, of the broader community. Absolutely. <clears throat> and it really is, it is all our business. It's not just those who have family members incarcerated or whose husbands are correctional officers because they're doing time as well. If, right. you, if you think about it, uh, they're doing time as well. But uh, it's a different... Um, authority, of course, um, but nonetheless, it's a very unusual um, way to live, um, to be in, in charge and control of someone else's life and keep them um, shackled and behind bars. It's got to it's gotta have an impact emotionally on, on correctional offices as well. So it's, there's a lot of things to look at in uh, prison reform. And we've only scratched the surface, Leah. <laughs> Lots of work to be done, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I know that uh, uh, Peter Wagner, uh, head of your organization, has been working on the um, the census. The uh, there's there's a bill um, here in the Commonwealth, um, a House bill and a Senate bill, that would require all of the inmates to be counted in the census from the community from which they came rather than the community that the facility sits in. Yeah, so this is a phenomenon um, that's kind of popularly known as prison gerrymandering. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because currently, as you mentioned, the Census Bureau counts incarcerated people at the prison facilities rather than at their home addresses. Mm -hmm. So when it's time to draw electoral districts um, for, you know, for voting purposes, you end up drawing state or local districts with these really big populations in prison who aren't from the local area and in 48 states aren't even allowed to vote at all. Right. So right. What that does is shift political power from the communities that these people come from and to the communities where um, that contain prisons essentially boosting the votes of everyone who lives next to the prison and diluting the votes of everyone else um, in any other district in the state or local government. And so I think that's another fact that most people who are listening to this broadcast, who read a newspaper, who watch daily news, who go out to work every day, have no idea about. It's just another way. You know, when you have a prison system that's this big, um, as we do in this country, you know, it spills over to have a pretty serious impact on things, even as fundamental as, you know, the very democracy that, you know, determines the political decisions that we make and who we elect as our political leaders and even how much our votes are worth. Well, the other thing, too, is that <clears throat> if uh, a given 
small town happens to house a prison facility and they can add 2,000 people to their census, then that gives them a better um, boost for getting federal funding, which doesn't necessarily help any of the inmates in the facility in that town. Fortunately, most um, funding formulas are pretty specifically tailored to meet particular needs. So, for example, funding for a school lunch program that's allocated from the state or federal government um, would be based, for example, on the number of children that are in the school. Right. So it's really, um, when you kind of get down to the, the, the bones of this problem, it's really a matter of um, electoral equality and how much, um, you know, a state or local government is honoring the Supreme Court's requirements of one person, one vote. One person, one vote. So, <clears throat> so that makes this whole business of changing the way the census is collected critically important to a variety of people who are not even aware of it. Absolutely. And actually, fortunately, um, you know, state and local governments are getting wise to the situation and are taking action. So far, four states have actually passed legislation to require um, that for state redistricting purposes, mm -hmm. uh, and in some states local redistricting purposes as well, incarcerated people are counted towards the totals in their home home communities rather than at the prison. So, um, and actually we found that more than 220 local governments around the country that have also taken action. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely, um, you know, a lot of momentum building to um, sort of try and, try and fix this distortion. Right, and it, as I mentioned, the, there is a House and a Senate bill that, would, uh, that seeks uh, redistricting of uh, prison inmates, and people should be calling their local and their uh, state representatives uh, to find out where they, those bills are. Absolutely. We're definitely watching um, watching the resolution very closely this session, mm -hmm. and we're very hopeful. So definitely please stay tuned. Yes, yes, everything is stay tuned. So we'd, we've talked about exorbitant telephone fees. We've talked about um, uh, the uh, redistricting and the improperly uh, uh, attained census. We've talked about um, drug-sniffing dogs uh, that frighten and separate families from their loved ones, um, thereby making it even more difficult for uh, those who are released from prison to to uh, reconcile and uh, re redeem themselves with their families and their communities. And what else have we talked about? Uh, and also the, um, the letter bans in local jails. The, the letter bans, which haven't hit us yet in this Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but could very well because some sheriff in one of the counties or more of this commonwealth is going to hear that some sheriff in California has boosted his um, budget by X million of dollars or whatever, and they're going to want to get on that bandwagon. You know, what I, what I really hope, though, is that now that, you know, we have this really solid research out there, and now that this, um, you know, there's been some really impressive grassroots organizing efforts at the local level, um, particularly from the folks who are directly affected, really speaking out. I'm really hoping that, you know, pretty shortly we'll see the end of this trend because sheriffs are finding that it's not actually saving them money and, um, you know, there are better ways to manage contraband mm -hmm. and it's really not worth the massive um, social harm that banning letters does. So mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that, you know, sheriffs are really going to see the light here and listen to the social science research and their own constituents and the major correctional professional associations. Exactly. Uh, that exactly. Is not, not a good, not a good direction to go in. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not a it's not a good place to be because um, it could it could impact their reelection too if if they happen to be in a county that elects the sheriffs. Absolutely. No, sheriff, yeah. sheriff needs to know. I mean, everything everything goes around. You know, what goes around comes around. Um, there's always some um, um, difficulty that one can experience as a result of participating in something without looking at all angles. That is um, something really important uh, for each of them to think about uh, because then they could become... Um, 
uh, th they could gain national attention in a negative way uh, right. for, for what they're doing. And I, I'm also thinking in California has so many people incarcerated that uh, they still have that that holdover from the the human rights decision uh, that was uh, that drew attention to the fact that they were thirty thousand inmates over. Uh, crowded in their facilities, and they were supposed to be releasing them, but they still haven't. But they've just shuffled them off to different institutions, is what I hear. Yep, that was a really big um, project. They called it realignment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically not dealing with the fundamental problem of just having too many people locked up and trying to play this sort of shell game, mm -hmm. reshuffling folks around in order to, um, you know, avoid avoid the the heart of the problem. Right. And, and we're not, I, I don't think that either of us is saying that we don't believe that we need to have some kind of prison system and some kind of incarcerative level for some people. But I, I think uh, as regards our organization, we do not believe that um, people who are incarcerated should be sent to prison for punishment, but as punishment and to be taken away from the society and their families is punishment in and of itself without also adding things like uh, these kinds of abuses or these things that, that destroy family relationships and, um, and the solitary confinement. Uh, I know there was an article about one of the Massachusetts facilities that had uh, broken a record of sorts where an inmate had been incarcerated in so, uh, solitary for 662 consecutive days. I, I can't even imagine what that really meant to that human being. I mean, he wasn't going anywhere anyway, but to be incarcerated within a solitary hole is what the inmates refer to it, to being in the hole uh, for 662 days is two years. It's a long time. It's a long time. Psycholo the psychological da damage that mm -hmm. long-term indefinite solitary confinement does is well documented. And, you know, international human rights standards are very clear that, um, you know, that constitutes torture. And there we go with the title of this broadcast, Mental Health in Your Neighborhood. That's really, that's really more truth than I thought when I um, came up with the title. There's more truth than I thought to it, and it, it's becoming more and more clear. Is there something specific that you would like to say to our listeners, because we're uh, running out of time, we probably have another five minutes or so? Um, I would just like to thank everyone so much for tuning in and listening. And um, if you get a chance, I would encourage you to visit our website. That's um, at www.prisonpolicy.org. We have lots of um, resources on a lot of actually the topics that we talked about today. Mm -hmm. um, in a, the research database as well as our own um, publications on issues like phone, um, phone call rates, and jail letter bans and um, prison gerrymandering. So we would love to, and we'd love to hear from you, so please um, you know, don't hesitate to get in touch. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. It sounds good. Uh, I, I just remembered that uh, a new women's prison opened in Chicopee. Did you hear about that? Yep. That was, um, um, was it about maybe six, six years ago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. perhaps. Yeah, <clears throat> and uh, I, I used to think that the only one that there was was the one in Framingham, uh, which ironically is now co-ed, but um, it's co-ed by different buildings on campus. Mm -hmm. But um, the um, it's fascinating that uh, prison expansion has included women inmates as well. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Unfortunately, nobody nobody's really getting left out here. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, this, um, it sounds like uh, what I said earlier about uh, prison being such a growth industry in the United States. We do incarcerate more of our citizens than any other country in the world, including China and Russia. That in, in and of itself should 
should raise the hair on your on the back of your neck. I <laughs> want to. <laughs> I know I, I say these things all the time, and then I, I when I hear myself say them, I say, now why isn't someone outraged and shocked by that, and why aren't they calling us or calling their legislature immediately and demanding answers? I don't know. <laughs> well, I think, particularly in the past couple of years, you know, I've definitely become more cautiously optimistic mm-hmm. um, that you know folks. Folks are starting to wake up to um, how out of line our system of mass incarceration in the United States is okay. um, internationally, and how it's you know really not serving mm-hmm. our purposes here at home. Right, right. So, <coughs> I want to take the last couple of minutes, Leah, to thank you for coming on the broadcast <coughs> on such short notice, for one thing, and for another, to talk about. The things that I've been talking about, because it's really important uh, for my listeners to know <coughs> that somebody else knows what I know, and that it's it's a, it's confirmed and affirmed that we need to do a lot more than we are doing about prisons and what we're what we're subjecting human beings to, um, either before they are incarcerated while they're incarcerated or when they're released. So it is important that we keep talking about these things. Thank you so much for coming on the broadcast. I hope to see you at the conference at yes. Boston University. I, I actually work at Boston University. So I'm going to um, see um, several people there, I'm sure. And um, um, I hope that you'll come back on the broadcast another time. Thanks very much, Louise. It's been a total pleasure. Thank you, Leah. So thanks to Prison Policy Initiative of Western Massachusetts. And let's close out with some music from our friend Shedrick Gavin. And thank you very much, Minister Hobbs. My pleasure.
can fly Just believe.